Do you think these wars are worth it? No. Iraq, we reckon that was about it. Saddam Hussein, nuclear biological weapons, about oil. When I went across that border from Kuwait into Iraq and it all kicked off, they were pumping oil out. I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I reckon it was all planned. Do you think it was wrong that America was just pulled out of Afghanistan like that? I reckon it was wrong going to Afghan full stop. How does it feel to kill a man? When I got my first kill, I thought I did something wrong. I felt like the nervous feeling inside. I said sorry. I know he's the enemy, but yeah, I put my hand on him and I said I'm sorry. You know, but it took me a good week to realise that what I'd done was my job. By the way, is, is your dog Betsy still with you? She passed away. I was going to shoot myself in America, and she saved my life. And, and how did she save you? Got a gun, had a gun in the house anyway, and I put one round in, and I stuck it in my mouth. And Betsy was on the back of the sofa, and she went that way with her head. I just looked at her, and I went, took it out, put it on the table. Trigger warning. Um, there's a lot of very emotional, at times probably quite disturbing content, um, and I just wanted to let you know that this is intense, so trigger warning. Craig, how does it feel to kill a man? Wow, um, it's unnatural to kill some, to kill a human, you know, and I think if you enjoy it, you, there's something wrong with you. But um, when I got my first kill, um, I thought I did something wrong, I felt like the nervous feeling inside, the gutting feeling inside. And I thought always that I was gonna get a tap on the shoulder and I was gonna get in serious trouble for it. You know, like, uh, can we have a quick word of you? You know, why did you kill this guy? Was you justified to kill this guy? Um, or we don't think you were, you're gonna to go to prison for it and such and such, but it never happened, you know? But it took me a good week to realize that what I'd done was my job. You know, I joined the army to do a job and I'd done my job at that time. But yeah, it's a, it's a whole what, empty feeling inside. You feel, feel quite sick. It's not a celebrational feeling at all, you know? But um, when I got my first kill, uh, the job had been done. And I saved a lot of lives doing it as well. So I've got to put that back in my, you know, the front of my mind as well, that I did a good job. Yeah. And can you talk us through the circumstances that led to that? Yeah, basically we are in Iraq, uh, we're in the desert called the Maysan Desert, and it's a, a massive desert, you know, and you can get lost in there and not find civilization. But the funny thing, going off that, but the funny thing is every time we stopped, a kid would tip up, and we would be 100 miles from nowhere, the little kid would tip up asking for water. You're like, where the fuck did you come from? <laughs> you know, but, um, and every time we stopped, it's called a MOG, called a Mobile Operational Group. So basically we'd move around the desert, and when a mission needs to be, um, mission needs to happen we would then act as a quick reaction force to do that mission so it was easier to just to be in the desert and move around but every time we stopped we got mortared um, and they were pretty fucking close mortars as well and we found out after a while that a motorbike was following us around so every time we stopped motorbike would spot us and then half an hour later would get mortared so um, it came to the decision from hire to take this motorbike out, take this guy out. And as soon as we take the guy out, you know, uh, we can move around the desert freely, uh, you know, and not get mortared. So and then I got the green light to do so. So what I planned to do is the Mog move off. And as he moved off, the motorbike broke cover to follow, follow the Mog along. And I stayed in place where we were originally. And yeah, I took him out, probably about 675 yards shot. Um, but you got to think in the desert, when you look at somebody in the desert through the heat shimmer, they look bigger, like you do on the films. And as they approach you, they get to their normal size. So yeah. you always got to aim for the center of mass. You know, you hear stories I hate shot all the time for snipers. It's not necessarily the case. Always aim for the center of mass. What, because there's more room for error? Um, yeah, so if you do hit him in the head and you aim for the center of mass, you know, you get different types of heat shimmer as well. You get four, you get boiling, racing, drifting, and um, walking um, heat shimmers. So your bullet will act in different ways to where it's, where it's going. But I hit him. Um, I, I missed on my first shot. I hit the bike. The bike fell over. And then I hit the guy on my second shot. Um, I, I hit him. Oh, so I hit him up here. Um, so, but I was aiming for centre of mass. Like you said, it's, it's more correctional forever. Um, I approached the guy, 
Um, he was taking his last breaths. Uh, the motorbike throttle was stuck in the sand. It was revving like fuck. He had an AK-47 strapped to it. Um, he had a map on him uh, in his hand. And also he had a, um, a radio. And the radio is called ICOM. It's called ICOM Chatter on it. And the Taliban are talking to him, telling him what's going on. What can we do? You know, where can we mortar next and stuff like that. So he had a lot of information on him. Um, yeah, he, he passed away. He passed away. In front of your eyes? In, in front of my eyes, yeah. Um, because I had to approach that body to make sure that I did kill him, you know. And he was beyond saving, beyond saving, because where, where I'd hit him, he wouldn't have survived anyway. Um, but, yeah, and that was my first kill, you know. And I said sorry. Did you? Yeah. To him? Yeah. Wow. I know he's the enemy. Um, is it the enemy? I'm not sure. The insurgents or whatever, but... Yeah, I put my hand on him and I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know. Um, I think I spoke to somebody after I'd done all my tours and they said, how do you feel, Craig? How do you feel? They've got family, they've got kids. And he, it hits you, you think, yeah, they have, you know. And, but they're also trying to kill us, you know, and that's what you got put in front of your mind as well. So once he passed away, um, we bagged him and tagged him, took all the information off him and the mortaring stopped, it stopped. And I was left with that image of him in my head for the whole week, thinking I was like the same as your first question, what does it feel like to kill someone? Yeah, it's a gutting feeling, it's a gutting feeling. Yeah, no tears, just a, a worrying feeling that you're gonna get in trouble sort of thing, you know? But once you've done your first call as a sniper, everything, you don't act as their human beings, their targets. Right. You know, cause you start thinking about the human beings you're gonna fuck up down the line somewhere and they're gonna take that first opportunity to take you out, you know? So it's either them or you. Mm. Wow. So you said you have never enjoyed a kill and if you did, that would, you know, be a bit messed up. I mean, have you met people that you've been deployed no, with I've, I've that heard, have I've, ever I've enjoyed heard, it? I've heard stories, yeah. you know, um, what I don't wanna go into, but I've, I've heard stories that people enjoy stuff you know, enjoy the killing, um, but for me, we, you know, it was a job, you know, I didn't go around doing it for pleasure, I did it because it had to be done and I had to save lives, mm. you know. And, you know, you mentioned people have asked you about how do you sort of feel about the families, um, is it something that you're able to calculate, you saved the lives of your whole was it a group, let's call it, mm. is that a logical explanation that you tell to yourself to, you have to suppress you, the yeah, emotions? You have to suppress it, you have to blank it out, you have to forget it. Like I said, they're not human beings at the time, they're targets, yeah. and you have to put your training in gear and say, this is what I'm going to do, and think what you're doing and who you're saving. You know, you don't need to make other thoughts in your head or what is it going to fuck up you know it's like um my wife uh tanya fucking breath of fresh air to me breath of fucking fresh air she says never go to bed on an argument okay because you don't know what happens when you're asleep all right so i i don't know where i was going with this then but about the killing yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. I'll think of it again in a minute. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a, yeah. You were talking about suppression, suppressing the emotions and seeing it as a logical target and an outcome. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I'll think of it in a minute, I forgot. So mm. apologise for that. Nothing to be sorry yeah, about. No um, what did you learn about yourself as a sniper? I like my own company. Good job. <laughs> yeah, I love me on company. Um, I'm better soldier than I thought I was. You know, um, because when I first joined the army, I was going, I was doing all sorts. You know, and I already wasn't concentrating on my career. So they took me out because I was based in London. I was based in Knightsbridge, Hyde Park. Um, so they took me out of London and took me to Windsor, and that's why I excelled in my career but I didn't really and I wish I concentrated at an early age I would have gone further in my career probably but um, 
yeah, I found that I was a better soldier than I thought I was. I enjoyed what I was doing, you know, and to be a sniper, you got more freedom on the battlefield as well. How do you mean? Um, like freedom. Um, people think a sniper, you go out and shoot someone. That's your job. It's not. Your first job is to gather lifetime information on the battlefield. That is your job. First priority. Once you've got all that information or the intel you, you need, then you would come back and then you would say, there we go, that's what you've got on this individual, that's what I know about him. And they look at it and go, right, you've got a green light to take that target out. And then you go back, reapply, and take that target out. How long has it been since you were discharged? Uh, 2013. So 10 fucking years yeah. and you're still... I am. I am so sad, so sad. I don't know why I'm so sad, I just feel shit. I can't control it. I can't control. I can't control not being happy. And I'm just tired of being sad. I'm just tired of. Just tired of it. And That's a lot of responsibility. It sounds like. A lot of responsibility. You get taught. Bar from special forces, you get taught as a sniper to be an adult. You know, and you get treated like an adult. Sometimes, when I was uh, before, I was a sniper in the army. You get treated like a kid. Sometimes, you know, yes sir, no sir, do this, do this. But when you become a sniper or SF, you know, you get What's treated, SF, um, special forces. Yeah, um, you get treated like an adult. You know, and you get more responsibility because the sniper course is fucking hard. You know, there's a high failure rate. I think 34 on my course, and I think four passed. You know, there's a high failure rate on the course because you've got to know yourself, you've got to dig deep. And when you're blown out your ass, running up a fucking hill, you've got to know yourself. You think, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, you know, and that's why I was going to go with... Um, never sleep on an argument. Never sleep on an argument. I'll go back to that. Like, never always be sure what you're doing is the correct thing that you're doing, okay? And then you can sleep easy. All right. So, like I said about my wife, never go sleep in an argument because you have a clear mind. Always do your job to the fullest as well, and you have a clear mind. All right. So, like going back to where killing and stuff like that, that's where it comes. Mm. So, things like Saving Private Ryan and American Sniper. How accurate are their depictions of war? Um, it's very Hollywooded. Very Hollywood. And I think if you go on YouTube channels, you get like X. Special Forces blokes with the film behind them, they critique it. Going, nah, that's impossible. <laughs> what the fuck's he doing? You know. You should do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I think when you we call it a tick, troops in contact. When you're in a tick, or when you're in a contact, and the enemy are shooting at, uh, with you know at you, it's not an hour. It's not two hours. It could be three minutes. Uh, but it feels like a fucking lifetime, you know? And it absolutely feels like a lifetime. Your adrenaline's pumping, but you've got to think. You're in charge of these guys and you need to think what you're doing. Hollywood's Hollywood, isn't it? They do it for the ratings, you know, fire and gun with one hand and stuff like that, you know? I take and it you haven't done that. <laughs> no, no. And you, they're in contacts for fucking ages. They're running around. It's just Hollywood, isn't it? It's Hollywood. But in reality, it's not, it's not like that at all. You get, when you go on tour, you know, as a sniper myself, I always, we call it used and abused. You know, you get used a lot to go on missions, to give overwatch for other things going in, taskings going in, SF going in. SF now have got this one power, and they're called um, FSG. Uh, they're the uh, Ford Operational Group, so they give the SAS overwatch. Before that was formed, they relied on other people from other regiments to come in and they relied on snipers to give overwatch and it was me and my number two that we used to do that quite a few of that especially in afghan and iraq you know before that all kicked off so you know so and you get more downtime than you do as a normal soldier than you would do if you were in a you know people think you go on tour you're fucking this 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 that's why sf blokes only do three months because they're so intensely bouncing off everything and snipers are used and abused and they bounce all the time. So when I come off tour, I'm physically fucked, you know? But yeah, you get more downtime than you do actually in a contact all the time, mm. so. And did you find it hard to 
have downtime. I have a lot of entrepreneurial listeners. Yeah. And entrepreneurs find it hard with downtime because the brain is always on and always looking to solve problems and make money. So you're downtime, you're prepping for the next mission. Yeah. So they said, oh, okay, you've got two days downtime. You think, fucking brilliant. But then you've got to prep all your kit. Because you need your kit, you've got to trust your kit, you've got to trust your rifle, you've got to trust your small arm, you've got to trust your long sniper rifle, you know, you've got to trust everything that you're doing and re and say, what's my mission? Like right, this guy here. And then you spend the whole day looking at that mission of that guy, looking at the terrain, map reading it, where am I going to insert, what am I going to do, what intel, what's, it, what's he done? So really your downtime is prepping for the next stuff. So, so there's no real downtime? No, no. no. Now, when you say where you insert, what does that mean? Insert, so basically if I was, uh, we're in King's Cross now and my mission was in Waterloo, um, I would insert into King's Cross and walk to Waterloo, right. you know, so I'll be inserted into a location. So you're often inserted a fair bit away, yeah. are you? Yeah, for sure. And why yeah. do they do that? Um, just so you're not overrun, they don't know you're there. You know, because no point dropping you on target, then fucking off, because they're going to think, well, they dropped off there. Next thing you know, they're getting taken out, yeah. you know. So, and they, they, they investigate, you know, they're not silly people. Yeah. They will investigate different scenarios on the ground that they're not comfortable with. So it's best to drop off at a location and walk in. Yeah. And, and plus you can make your mind up as well. Where, you know, you think, well, like, on the map, that looked fantastic. But in reality, over there looks better, right. you know. So yeah. that's, that's the reason. So what character traits or skills do you think makes a great sniper? Um, patience, a lot of patience. Uh, like I said, your own company. Um, can you work in a pair? There's 16 in a platoon. and snipers. In a platoon, yeah. um, but, but then you work as a pair. So you get delegated a mission and you'll go off attached to some, somebody else and then you go off and do that mission as a and pair. Um, because there's no such thing as lone wolf anymore. Right. You know, you don't go lone wolf it, you know, because yeah. you need support, right. you know, and to look for a scope constantly for 48 hours, because as a sniper, you're sustainable on the ground without resupply up to 72 hours, right. minimum 48 hours. Yeah. Um, but looking for a scope constantly, you know, you get tired, you get yeah. fatigued. So you catnap, number two will take over here, right. catnap. You are cat nap, you are cat nap. And it's usually number two is better at doing the calculations, and number one behind the rifle is better at taking the shot. Right. But luckily, me and my number two, I don't want to say his name, but me and my number two, we were the same level um, uh, competence wise and snipering. So we just yeah. took it in turns to do what we do. Mm. Um, I won't ask you because I respect that, but what's the reason you don't want to say his name? Um, I think he deserves his own privacy. Oh, um, he's just been discharged at the army with severe CPTSD. What's CPTSD? Uh, chronic oh, PTSD. Really? Same, same as me. I got discharged before, and he got discharged a couple of uh, couple of months ago. And he's in a really shit bad way. Yeah, yeah. His whole life fell apart. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that. Um, yeah. yeah, a bit later on. Um, well, no, let's talk about it now. Yeah. Or we've brought it up. So. Um, let's talk about your discharge, mm -hmm. because were you in about 20 years service? 23 years. Wow, it's a long time. Yeah, the, the normal colour service is 22 years. What does colour service um, mean? The colour service is basically um, your full service that you do in the army. Right. So join when you're 16, leave when you're 40, 22 years. So it's a sort of standard yeah, yeah. Yeah, sort of procedure. Yeah. But they, they brought a thing called VENG, um, not sure what it stands for, but you could sign on after you're 22 for another five years. And is that what you did? Yeah, that's what I'd done because I didn't want to get out. Why not? Because I got out after Kosovo and I got out for eight months and fucking hated it. Wow. Absolutely fucking hated it. And the reason why I got out is because I was, there was no help for people with PTSD. And I what, didn't know, within, I, yeah, within the army, yeah. uh, within the forces itself. And I remember after the Kosovo tour, um, walking into an office and there was a lady sat there and she goes, how are you feeling? Me, yeah, I feel fine. Okay, off you go. And that was fucking it, you know? And that was your, that was your medical assessment that you're okay to go away and not ho go home, you know, and not kick off, you know? And that was it. And, but I felt- Why did you say you were okay if you weren't? Two things I fucking hate. One, the word man up. And, um, there's a, yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah. 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 The, the man up. Yeah. And the other one is said, um, there's another one. Um, 
man a, 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 a so, soldier on, soldier on. And I enjoyed my job. And if you knew you had a problem back then, you will get segregated, you know, they look into it more, they don't know what they're fucking doing and everything. And I didn't want to be that class as that one person. So I discharged out of the army and to sort my head out and try and do it myself. I didn't know I had something wrong with me. I felt something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. You know, I, it was like when you're young as a kid, when my time, probably my wife's time as well, I didn't know about paedophiles. I didn't know about that word. I didn't know about bullying or anything like that because we were sheltered as kids. But this day and age, it's in the full light now, isn't it? Everybody, everybody knows about it. And it's like that in the army. You know, back then, it was a taboo. T PTSD was a taboo. And not many people had it, but didn't want to say they had it, you know? And you said sometimes real anger comes out. What are you angry about? I carry a lot of guilt. One of my vehicles got blown up. I thought, why the fuck wasn't it me? Why wasn't it me? You can't cry. You can't get lost in yourself and stand there in shock. You have to, your training has to kick in. And so... And what were they worried about? Um, just a stigma of getting kicked out, you know, um, being full of drugs, um, not getting any help, being left... You just get discharged at the army and that was it. Right. There was no help out there at that time. You're lost, walking around with PTSD, flashbacks, chronic nightmares, night terrors and everything, and there's no help out there for you. And you're like, what the fuck's going on? And that's why I made the command decision to get out to see if I could sort my own head out, right. but I couldn't cope with civilian life. Why not? Because I was so institutionalised since I was 16, you know, until I was 20 odd years old, and I was like, ah, I just can't get on with Civvy Street, I can't focus. Civvies are doing, Civvies are weird. <laughs> they do weird things, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, and I thought, fuck this. Like what, what, what are we weird? But no, 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 like paying bills. Because when the army, you don't pay anything. You got an, you got accommodation. Yeah. You don't pay for your scoff, your food. You know everything's provided for you. So when you leave the army, you're in the big bad world. You've got responsibilities now. You're like, ah, oh, fuck! I've got to get a job. I've got to do this. I've got to do what the fuck? And because you've got common sense, and some civvies haven't, you think there's an easy way of doing that, mate. Put that there instead of that there. That work. You know, and you think, what is he? And I couldn't cope with all that. So I, I just rejoined, I rejoined. And it took me um, three days to rejoin. Um, because- but What does that mean? You had to do more training, do you No, mean? no, because oh. at the time, I was going for um, two, three SAS reserves that were based in Newcastle. And they're the TA, SAS TA. And I was going through them. I thought I'd just do TA, you know, but it was so slow going for it and I was getting a taste back in my mouth. I was going, yes, I fucking love this with shit, but it's so fucking slow. So I said, fuck it, I'll rejoin, I'll rejoin. And I rejoined and three days um, I was back in the regiment. No one know I got out. Right. That's the weirdest part. They always thought, because I, I was out for eight months, a short period, they always thought I had a posting somewhere. Right. And I came back to the regiment and go, oh, welcome back, great, good posting. Mm. But no, I got the fuck, I got the fuck out. Did you, you know? tell them you got out? Uh, yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. lie, to tell yeah. the truth. Yeah, I got out. Oh, what'd you go? Oh, do you enjoy it night? Yeah, it was all right. Do you know, put a little bit of white light there. <laughs> yeah. and, but oh, I, I, do, I do tell the truth, and I say, no, I couldn't handle Silver Street. Yeah. And I warn people getting out at the time, people who were getting out in a couple of weeks' time, and I rejoined, be careful, mate. It's a fucking different world out there. You think the grass is greener? But it's not. You know, think of what you're doing, you know? And that's what they did, you know? But three, three, three days I joined, and then a month later, I went to Iraq. Wow. Yeah. And because I was going to the SAS reserves, my skills and drills were already there as a soldier. So I was already good. Yeah. So I didn't need pre-training going back into the regiment. So. Yeah. So there's two things that have popped up there. One is you said you don't like man up and soldier on. I'd like to ask why. And then to finish, 22 years service, discharged. What happened? Why? Um, my wife noticed first. My wife noticed first. There was something wrong with me, you know, because my Afghan tour, my last tour was a fucking... Yeah, it was... Um, that was my worst tour. My worst tour. 
got fucking smashed. Fucking smashed. And do you remember I said you get used and abused? You know, as I said in the army, you just bounce off to task to task. Fucking constant. I was physically fucked, you know, um, and... What does what does smash mean? What happened? Um, I started off with sixteen guys, and I came back with six original guys off that tour, not through deaths, through injuries and amputees and getting blown up and stuff like that. But I came back with six original guys from that tour. My officer got whacked in the first three weeks of being on that tour, so I was doing an officer's job. Was whacked and killed? No, no, um, an injury. He oh. got an injury. Um, he broke his back um, in a vehicle accident chasing the Taliban and um, it all went wrong and but I was ended up doing an officer's job as well as a, my sergeant's job you know and so I was doing and an officer's job is stressful enough they get hardly fucking no sleep and I was fucked anyway you know and I was doing the logistics side as a sergeant so yeah so it was a constant constant battle you know and I came back and Tanya said I came back a different man total different man you know um, I got blown up on that tour um, well twice one was near me but I didn't hit me shockwave did but the one fucking hit me hit my vehicle quite bad and everything that I was subsiding in my brain through Bosnia through Kosovo through the Iraq tours fucking just smashed and everything was just going to like a flicker show in front of my face. And I, was, I couldn't control images. I couldn't control the smell, the taste. I couldn't control anything that I was doing. But I put a mask on. I put a fucking mask on. And I thought, fucking hell. Fucking hell. Right, right, okay, okay. I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. Like banging, clicking, reacting to it. Not sleeping at night. Night terrors, you know. And I was... I felt all right. I thought I was hiding it. And Tanya noticed it, noticed it first. And she goes, and she approached me. And we're, we're very honest with people um, and very honest with it as a couple. And she said, um, you're not right, there's something wrong with you. Did she know what? Did she notice anything specific? I don't think she understood about PTSD. Um, she clearly understands it now because she's living with it. And I do believe she's got secondary PTSD off me, wow. you know, through my depression. And I call it infect. If you're in a room full of happy people and there's one person that's fucking miserable, it's effective that everyone's going to go, fucking hell, he's fucking miserable, fuck her, isn't he? And the other person, yeah, he's fucking miserable, isn't he? And everyone else is getting more and more miserable because you're infecting them with your misery. And I do believe that wives with people with PTSD get secondary PTSD. It's a known fact as well, you know? And then I was still in the army, um, still doing tour, uh, not tours, still going on exercise. Um, I taught down a sniper school for two years, which I fucking loved, you know, teaching um, and teaching a passion that I loved as well. And then when I was going on exercise, it was like I was there. It was like I was in Afghan. It was like I was in Iraq. It was like I was in fucking Kosovo and Bosnia. It was just like that, you know, and when other regiments or other squadrons that we had were playing the enemy, that was it. I fucking wanted them. And the army noticed it. The army noticed it. And I got called into the medical officers. What, is it, what exactly did they notice? Um, my aggression, right. my loneliness, because I used to sit on my own in the mess, because sergeant used to sit in the mess, um, sergeant's mess and all that. And I used to sit on my own eating dinner. Then I'd go and sit on my own in the, next to the bar on my own. Um, I just ostracised myself from other people. Did, you didn't want to sit next to anyone, did you? Did you even know what was going on? No. no. It just happened. I just didn't want to be around people, you know? Um, then I got called into the MO's office. And, he's, and the, my squadron leader was there. My sergeant major was there. And the medical officer was there. And um, they confronted me and they said that, you know, we're going to send you to get some psychiatric help because um, we believe you got um, CPTSD, well, PTSD at the time. And I went, OK. And I thought, just, just go with it, Craig. How did you feel, though, when that Empty, happened? gutted. Um, I sat in my car and I cried. Cause he, and I said, what do I do now? And she could go home. Go home. 
do not come back into camp, just go home. And I went home and I saw Tanya and I said, I'm getting kicked out. They wanted me to go for psychiatric help and stuff like that, which I did. And then they diagnosed me with a TBI, which is a magic brain injury when I got blown up. Um, they, um, my hips were fucked um, and they diagnosed me with CPTSD, chronic PTSD. And now, why, call it, why it's called chronic PTSD is because it's multiple incidents. Now, if you got knocked over by the car and you got PTSD, you got PTSD from getting knocked over by a car. I've done 10 tours, mate, you know, and everything's just shattered in my brain. And I'm thinking of images, people that I've killed, people that I've taken out, dead bodies that I've seen, mass graves that I've dug up, you know, and I can't control it. And that's what I do when I close my eyes. This is what I see all the fucking time. To this day now, I see it, you know. And I was quite open with Tanya, and she cuddled me. She, um, she cuddled me and she goes, everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. And I thought, I'm gone, I'm, I'm gone, I'm, I'm ill. I'm ill. That's what the doctor said, you're ill. And in fact, I wasn't allowed back in camp. Um, I just, they call it gardening leave, where they just send you home. And I was just festered at home. For a year, I festered at home. While they arranged my um, medical discharge. And then I got discharged. So 23 years. I did, and it took me half an hour to get kicked out. Half a fucking hour. Not even a thank you, not even a well done, nothing. For what I'd done, what I achieved, just left, left. And that's why um, I don't get involved in any military stuff now, like reunions and stuff like that. No, fuck you, fuck you, you know. Why do you think they didn't acknowledge you in that way? It's using abuse, just a number. 25000479. You're just a fucking number. And that's it. Their job's done now. Somebody else took my job now. I'm out. Somebody else took my job. Easy replaceable. But at the time, when you're doing it, and you're in the fucking thick of it, getting shot at, getting fucking blown up, seeing your mates pass to die, fucking legs amputees, you know, you don't think the army would treat you like this. You know, they did. They did. Yeah. Do you think you've progressed with your... Um, I'll use the word recovery. I don't really know how else to say it, but, you know, you thought this is never going to get better and you still feel all this pain today. Do you think you've made progress since you left? I, I still wear a mask. I still wear a mask. I've got a book that I write things in. The book's about this fat. You know, Tanya got it me when in London once and it's got a lock on it. And I write everything down, the vilest fucking thoughts and that I come into my mind, everything I can think of, I write down in this book all the fucking time. Then I lock it and then I scream and I shout and I scream and I shout and I cry in my car. I let it all out so I'm hoarse in the throat, you know, and then I go home. And I go to Tanya, all right, yeah, everything good, yeah, I'm fine. And I give her a big cuddle. Don't bring it home. I, do, I try not to bring it home. She knows. She's not a stupid woman. She knows that I still suffer. You know? We don't even sleep together. Because I have bad night terrors. I end up hitting her at night. Stuff like that. Doesn't mean I don't love her. Fucking hell, she's my life. Everything, everything to me. If I hadn't got her, I wouldn't be sitting and talking to you now. You know? Because I suffer from um, suicidal ideation. So I think about it all the fucking time, all the fucking time. When I wake up in the morning, I take a sigh and I go, fucking still alive. And then I crack on with the day. And then at night I go to bed and I sigh and I go, fucking another day gone. I'm still here. And I go to sleep and I wake up, go to sleep, go restless, tossing and turning. I want so many drugs to help me sleep. It's fucking ridiculous. 
That's all they seem to do. And if anyone listening to this is suffering from mental health, PTSD, or anything like that, medication helps. These people that say, oh, I don't want to be on medic, it fucking helps. It gives you that even keel, you know? It stops you dipping, it stops you rising up, it just gives you that flat level, and it helps you. It helps you a lot, you know? And I recommend, recommend it to people that are struggling. But yeah, it's just, it's just bullshit. How long has it been since you were discharged? Uh, 2013, I got discharged in October. So 10 fucking years yeah. and you're still... Oh, massively. I am... I am so sad. So sad. And I sit in my therapist and he goes, how's your day? How's your week? I goes, I'm just so sad. I don't know why I'm so sad. I just feel shit. I can't control it. I can't control. I can't control not being happy. We don't go out. Me and my wife don't go out. We don't do stuff. Because I just, I fret all the time. I got a train here. It took a lot of strain to come here. And I'm just tired of being sad. I'm just tired of, just tired of it just tired and I don't know why I'm, I'm always sad sorry well thank you so much for coming here today How do you help other people who are suffering with CPTSD? Because we were talking about that a bit before we went live, weren't we? And how you feel that, you know, there's not enough investment in mental health help. I am, I'm not an advocate for mental health or anything. I'm not that. I am, I just want to help people. And I, like we spoke to before, um, the government thinks they're doing things by giving money to charities, certain charities, and they think that's their, that's their part done now because they've given all that fucking money to charities. The charities don't know what to, they don't spend it on it. Every quid that goes to a charity, one P gets spent on where it's meant to be going. The rest gets sucked up on administration fees. So it's just fucking appalling, you know? And I've opened a survival school, a bushcraft school, called the Maverick Survival School. Web pages are it's on the internet, everything. Do you want to shout it out? Yeah, the Maverick Survival School, uh, uh, .co.uk. And I've got access to 57 acres of woodblock. And I take veterans not just veterans, civilians, um, first line responders, and they come down to the school and we just sit in the woods Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, and we just do bushcraft stuff. And we sit and talk over an open fire. It's not tens, 10 people, it's not hundreds of people. It could be just one person that comes. And it just could be two people. And that's why I like it, because it's more interactive, it's more personal. And people want to meet me, because of what I have achieved and my story, you know. And then they open up to me. I'm no therapist, you know. And that's what people <laughs> must remember, that I'm not a therapist. But somebody that's suffering from CPTSD, talking to someone who has CPTSD, you bounce off each other and you give each other, other support. And when I finish on the Sunday afternoon and I go home, Apart from looking scruffy as fuck and <laughs> smelling a burnt wood, Tanya says, you're different. You seem different. Fully, fully exhausted. But she says, you seem different. You seem... Because I'm helping other people, you know? And I sort of lose myself a little bit by helping other people achieve what they want to do. And that, that, that's what I want to... That's what I want to concentrate on. I've got a full-time job as well. What do you do? Um, I just work in a factory. Do you like it? Yeah, I do, yeah. They're very good to me, very good to me. And they understand my needs, 
you know. So if I need a 10 minute break, you know, if I hear a noise and I don't, my mind's thinking of something else, they give me that break, yeah. The, the two gentlemen in charge of it, the COs, fucking super nice people, you know, and they accommodate me, which, you know, I couldn't ask for anything else. And then weekends I do my survival school. Do you miss the military? Fuck, do I miss it? Yeah. That was obviously a stupid question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but Tanya says, do you miss it then? Or do you miss it now? And I thought, well, I've never experienced now. I always experienced then. So yeah, I do miss it. But my number two who got discharged, um, he says, fucking shit, Craig, it's changed so much. So PC, got to do this, got to do that. Got to, you know, you, you got to go with the times of PC-ness, if that's such a word. Um, and he said, it's shit. He said he couldn't wait to get out, and then obviously his mental health took took control of it. But um, yeah, I miss it. I miss it. Yeah, I wish I was younger. I would go back in. Yeah, How old are you now? I'm 47 years old. Yeah, and I'm fucked. My hips are fucked. I've got a hip replacement in November. This oh this month, 16th, getting this hip replaced. This one got done last year due to my me getting blown up. I get migraines all the time. I'm constantly tired and lethargic, you know? I don't, my wife is, I know I talk about Tanya, but she is, she's my backbone. You know, and I talked about earlier about suicidal ideation. If I didn't have her in my life, you know, I'd be a different, it'd be a different story, massive different story, you know? And then I, um, yeah, yeah. Do you think having therapy, at, oh, let me go back. Do you have regular therapy? Every Thursday. Yeah. And do you think that's helped you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see a gentleman called Ross Hoare. Fantastic, fantastic base in Southampton. Um, pay out my own pocket, but so the military don't pay for it. No, do they fuck? Do they fuck? If you went to a military charity, they would give you six sessions, and that's it. So twenty-three years service, and they won't pay for once no. a week therapy. No, will they fuck? No, they fuck. The only good thing I don't pay for my medication because I'm a veteran. That's a good thing because yeah. that'd be over a hundred pound. Um, a week. Yeah, wow. Over. Yeah. But the gentleman I see, Ross, fucking angel. Yeah. A fucking angel. I sit there and I scream and I fucking shout at him. Call him a see you next Tuesday, fucking everything. And I let it all out, all my fucking anger, all my thoughts and everything. And he sits and, poor fucker, he sits and wears it. And he gives me ways to cope with it. Ways to... unburden me with it, you know? He's well aware that I'm sad. Well aware of it. Well aware that I wear a mask and sometimes I wear a mask with him. And he says, don't fucking, and he's honest with me. He says, don't, don't wear a mask here, Craig. Fucking take it off at the door, you know? Honest guy, honest guy. And I'm glad I, well, Tanya found him for me. And I'm very, very appreciative that she did at the time. I was well bad at the time. But he says he's seen a change in me. You know, he has seen a change in me, the way I used to be to where I am now. So there is a change. More time goes on, you do change, don't you? You know, you become, you still have it. Like, t like Tanya says to me, you still have it. You still have them thoughts and they will never ever fucking leave you because you've been there, you've done that and they will never leave you. But time will get easier as it goes on, you know? And what are those things that your therapist does to help you? You said he gives you some sort of tools to help. Yeah, he gives me tools. Um, I touch things sometimes. It's called grounding. So if I sort of lose myself in my own mind and start talking, thinking about negative things, I touch things and it's called grounding. And you ground yourself to think, you, I'm here. 
you know, we'll walk past a building, you tap it and you think, I'm here, you know. Um, we do EMDR, which he does his finger in front of my f face like this, and he takes me to that moment that I'm thinking about. And he will say, where are you now? And I'll tell him I'm there. It's not hypnotising, it's the way your brain copes with it. <laughs> don't know how it works, but I've got some instances where I don't want to talk about, um, that which I've done as a sniper and really affect me. You know, and now I wouldn't say it's a distant memory, but it's now a memory. It's not so prominent in my in my thoughts. And, so, and why don't you want to talk about it? It's just stuff I don't want to bring back up. I've done what I've done. And you said sometimes real anger comes out. What are you angry about? Guilt. Um, yeah, guilt. I carry a lot of guilt. A lot of guilt. One of my vehicles got blown up. And um, not a religious guy, but I believe in fate, you know, and was on top of this hill. And uh, the foot patrol went off and they had, we were their support. And I said to them, um, what we'll do, we'll send a vehicle off. So it's tracking them in the low ground, we're on the high ground still, so we have to support. And I said, I'll do that, I'll go. So I wheeled off and I thought, no, I'm going to stay here. And I sent my other course sign off, my other vehicle off, and then he got blown up. And um, I thought, why the fuck wasn't it me? Why wasn't it me? You know, when I got there, you can't, you can't cry. You can't get lost in yourself and stand there in shock. You have to, your training has to kick in, organise stuff, do this, do that, do that. And we were getting shot at still as well. We you know, they opened fire on us in this ground and we, so I was trying to concentrate on everything. And don't forget I'm doing an officer's job and a sergeant's job, so I'm doing everything, you know. But yeah, I've got guilt. I've got guilt. Yeah. Wish I put my men in certain places that I, but that's the PTSD. That's the PTSD, the guilt, the shame. Um, I've killed people, images, um, images of friends that I know that have passed away, going to their funerals when you're at home, everything just, uh, and it, you can't control it in your brain. Your brain's a fantastic thing. Big computer, isn't it? But you just can't can fucking control it. I couldn't control anything. Does it help make you feel better when you help other people experiencing the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, even like Tanya says, you know, you don't realise what good you're doing. Like, um, train station today, you had a guy tap me on the shoulder. Craig? I went, yeah. He goes, mate, you're doing such a fucking good job. Such a fucking, I've been watching you, watched everything that you do. And he sat next to, he sat opposite us in the train. I didn't know who he was, you know. And then he'd come off the train station. He said that to me. And how does that make you feel? That I've helped someone realise their mental health issues and how to cope. And they need to talk. Men need to talk about mental health. Don't let it be a stigma where you can't fucking talk. Men need to talk. Women talk about it. Men need to talk about it. You know. And I've always said on the podcast that I've done. If you can't talk to anyone, contact me through my Instagram and I'll fucking talk to you. You know, I'll answer all your questions for you. Come down to the survival school. We're sitting in there and just shoot this shit. Lose ourselves in the woods. You know, go back to nature. And that's what it's all about. And when someone comes up to you and says thank you for everything you've done, does that bring any positive emotion into you? Can you still feel happiness? It's more shock, you know? I tell you, because I'm so fucking proud of you, I'm so proud of you, and I'm thinking, in my head I'm going, I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything. I'm my worst own enemy. Without a fucking doubt. I don't realise what I'm doing. But other people looking into my bubble realise what I'm doing. Yeah, 
and they go, fucking, he's doing such a fucking good job. You know, like I said, I'm not an advocate for mental health, but I'm doing so much for mental health by talking, by getting upset, by reliving stuff, you know, letting people know it's fucking good to talk and it's okay to take fucking medication, all right? It's fucking okay. You have side effects like low libido, being affectionate and stuff with your wife, with Tanya, I haven't done it for ages, but she'd rather have me on this fucking planet on medication than hanging from a fucking tree. And what do you think stopped you? Uh, um, by the way, is, is your dog Betsy still with you? She passed away June, a couple of months ago. Biggest impact in my life, that little dog. It's a little dog. Biggest impact in my life. I try not to think about her because it upsets me. She, she saved my life. I was going to shoot myself in America. And she saved my life. And me and her were fucking tight as you like. Um, and she passed away. <laughs> I can't replace her. I can't replace her, you know? I had her cremated and I talked to her every day. She's in the house. I talked to her every day. Yeah, big impact in my life. And, and how did she save you? I put a gun in my mouth. Um, Tanya was in England, because we lived in America for three years. And uh, we got death threats um, off. Yeah, yeah off. Um, they wanted to cut my head off. H who's they? Uh, Al-Qaeda. Um, Fuck, how did they fight? Uh, because my name got leaked to the media um, about what I did in Afghan. Who fucking did that? Um, Aren't you supposed to be protected from that yeah, kind of stuff? Yeah, it never did. And it went, um, basically on my medals parade, um, they had a freelance journalist there. And um, whatever story a freelance journalist does or journalist does, and it goes to Whitehall, to the London District Media Ops, and then they redact it, censor it, and then they, um, it never got done. It went straight to print. So my wife's name, uh, my daughter's name, a dog's name, where I lived, where I was born, everything. It was all in the... All in the paper. And then, um, I don't think my missus is clairvoyant, right? but she always trusts her gut instinct. And she says, something's wrong with this. And everyone just put her down, like they always fucking do. They always put her down and say, no, don't be silly, don't be silly. Let him enjoy it. No, biggest mistake. We got put into hiding in England. We was, until I got discharged out of the army, and then the death threats got worse, so we emigrated to America for three years. How, how, did, um, how did you receive the death threats? How did um, there was through one few articles were in the newspaper um, saying that they wanted to cut my, I still got the new article saying they wanted to cut my head off in, in um, protest of what I did in, in Afghan, being a sniper, prize, isn't it, you know? And I do believe um, the police spoke to me and they found a car in Birmingham lined out um, with plastic, uh, with my photo in it, uh, ready to kidnap me. Um, and they overthrew that sort of like plot and they said, look, the death threat's are fucking real, you know? And I think my wife was close, Tanya was close to having a breakdown at the same time. She did, she, you know, she's, she's a London girl. You know, and when I met her, she doesn't know anything about the army. But the more I went on with my army career, more she understood, you know, but she didn't understand with the PTSD. She didn't understand the threat level that we were under. But, you know, she, she knew, she, she does now, you know. So you emigrated to America? Went to America and then um, loved it. 
loved it, had a good job. Um, we bought a house over there. Uh, we bought the dogs over, Winnie and Betsy. And um, Tanya went back to England for her brother's um, 20th or 21st birthday. And no, it was 30th, sorry, 30th birthday. And uh, I was left on my own in the house and I was down, I was depressed and just lying to Tanya, said, I'm fine, go, I'm fine. And then my dining room table was like where this table is now, my sofa was, back of the sofa was where you are. And then and I got, you know, got a gun, had a gun in the house anyway for protection. And I was put it in my head, no rounds in it, thinking, where, where do I put it? Where do I put it to fucking do it? And I put one round in. I stuck it in my mouth as far as I could, near enough choking on it. And Betsy was on the back of the sofa. And she went that way with her head. And she went the other way. And I went, just looked at her. And I went, took it out, put it on the table. And then I reached out to someone and the police came round the house and they took the gun away. They said, usually we will take you away as well, but we're not. We've, we've read up about you, they said. We've read up about you, we know who you are. We'll send a car around later on to make sure you're still here, you're okay, which they did. And Tanya didn't know for ages. How long? I'm not sure. Wow. And how did you tell her? Uh, I got an email from someone who had reached out to and said, Greg's in a bad way. And I was like, what's happened? And she said, we had to get the police out to the house. And I was like, oh my God. Um, and then I got in contact and said, well, Greg, what's going on? What's going on? And then he told me that I've got a flying straight back. Yeah. Do you think you would have told Tanya if that didn't happen? I'm sorry. Sorry that I put her through all this. She didn't deserve it, you know. I would have told her. I wouldn't have told her. You wouldn't have. No, would I fuck? Would I fuck? It's my it's my battle. And that's me being a, a bloke. It's my fucking battle. I didn't know about the stigma then, you know, like it is now. A fucking bloke. put the mask on and, you know, crack on. Soldier on, man up. Two things I fucking hate now. Why, why do you hate that? It's just fucking content. Man up. You fuck off. You walk my fucking shoes for one fucking day. You walk my shoes for one day. Sleep in my fucking bed. Take my fucking drugs for one day. And tell me afterwards to fucking man up. And I expect your apology afterwards. Yeah. Do you think these wars are worth it? No, not at all. Not at all. If you ask, um, Iraq, what do you reckon that was about? I don't know, you tell me. Nuclear weapons, was it? Saddam Hussein, nuclear biological weapons. About oil. All about oil. When I went across that border from Kuwait into Iraq, when it all kicked off, they were pumping oil out. The guy, the guy that um, Tony Blair sent out to do an inspection, on nuclear weapons, came back and he said he hasn't got any nuclear weapons. Okay. So he sent him out again, the same guy, came back, wrote a report, Saddam Hussein has got no nuclear capable biological weapons at all. Okay. Two weeks later, he was found a mile away in a wood 
near where he lived, this guy was, committed suicide. His wrist was slit and he was propped up against a tree. And when the police arrived, he was flat out away from the tree. And they, the autopsy said the slits in his wrist would not have killed him. They weren't deep enough. And there was no blood around him at all. And then a month later, we went to Iraq saying he's got capable nuclear biological weapons. I'll leave that with you. Fuck. And when we went across the border, I remember standing up in my vehicle and all I could see were oil pipes. As far as the fucking eye can see is oil pipes with chalked numbers on. And what were the chalk numbers? From what, what number oil pipe it was. 2,956. Well, that's, that's the oil pipe going in. Yeah. Because when we went in, it was like daylight, but it was pitch black. Pitch black. Because all the Iraqis knocked all the oil heads off and set all the oil, oil pumps on fire. And all the sky was black. So it was like black for days it was. They had to use torches. That's how dark it was. Yeah. Are oh, these wars were worth it? Uh, look at Afghan. What was that war about? Um, after um, Osama bin Laden. You know, terrorism, stuff like that. And it just carried on, didn't it? It just carried on. IDs, waste of time. Waste of men that I've lost. Men that have got injured. Myself, mentally shattered. And now the Americans poured out, left billions of stuff there, even left the dogs on the runway in their kennels. And they all fucked off and let the Taliban relocate. You know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I reckon it was all planned down the line. How quickly they swept across Afghan, regaining all the towns and townships. Yeah, without a doubt. Just disgusting. When you say it was all planned, you, you mean they did a deal? So I don't know. I don't know how it would work, to be honest with you, but somewhere down the line, something got said and something got done. How quick everything got done, you know? Do you think it was wrong that America was just pulled out of Afghanistan like that? I reckon it was wrong going to Afghan full stop. Trouble is, where America go, we follow. But we went into Afghan, then the Americans came in. We went to Iraq, the Americans came in after us, which is fair enough, you know, because we were sorting stuff out. But, yeah, it's just... Think about it now, it was just a waste of fucking time. But you don't think about it then. You've got a job to do. You've got a job you're trained to do. You try and do it the best you fucking can. Do you think, from what you've seen, there's any way to avoid these wars? Or are we just always going to be fucking killing each other until <laughs> we, keep, we wipe all exactly. of us out? Wars, wars. So they're never going to stop? No, no. I think Africa's good, you know, we've been fighting for years. Ukraine, the, is it the west of Ukraine? Be, no, the east, is it? They've been fighting for 10 years plus with the Russians and stuff like that, you know? Don't understand what's going on there. We sort of lost reality with that war a little bit. No one's told us, you know, yeah, Russia wants to take over and bring it back to the original USSR, but you think, oh, it's all over, you know? Everyone just loses the concept of what we're fighting for. You know? And how does that make you feel? I don't know. Numb to that war because I'm not in it. We're not involved in it. England's not involved in it, which is a godsend. You know, lives aren't getting wasted and lost for no reason at all. And I think that's, the, that's a godsend. You know, and I'm out now. And all I think about is me and my wife and the little dog that we've got, Teddy. That's all I think about. And that's my priority in life, is them two, you know? Provide for my wife, work, work hard, and go home. And that's what I try and do. Do you feel conned that you were sent on these wars? Now, um, 
waste of time. Yeah, <laughs> not conned, misled. Yeah, just misled. You get misled information. You're thinking right, and you think to yourself, the people that I've killed, was it justified that I've killed them? Did they really do that? But at the time, it's the mission. You don't know, so. And why do you do these podcasts? We were talking about some of the um, reach you've had with some, you know, really big podcasts. Um, yeah, why do you do them? One, I want to advertise my, be truthful, I want to advertise my Maverick Survival School to people that are struggling and there is help out there, there is light out there. Like I said, I'm not a therapist, but I do understand what people go through. Um, and talk about mental health. Talk about my mental health. And people go, fucking hell. He's six foot four, he weighs 19 stone, he's a big bloke. He just cried. He just opened up about his mental health. Fucking yeah, I feel like that. Or some wife's watching it and going, my husband isolates himself. He's very niggly with me, sleeps a lot, doesn't really talk to me much. And then she approaches him and is going, are you okay? Do you want to talk? And that's what it's all about. Some of the questions I've got here I don't really feel right to ask them. Um, but I think I'm going to anyway, because you've made a big effort to be here. And I want to do my job, which is to get your message out to as many people as possible. So if you think any of these questions are shit, you can <laughs> give me the feedback yeah. and tell me they're shit, because <laughs> I'm sure I ask some shit questions. Um, did you ever blatantly disobey any orders? No. No, I know I paused then, but no, I was thinking, no, I didn't. Do you, I, do you wish some you had? Um, no, because as a sniper, it's the intel that you've gathered. That makes sense. So you're responsible. Like I said, first, first role of a sniper, gather lifetime information. So it's your information that you're gathering on that person before you take them out. And that's the important bit. So if you ignore an order, have I ignored order? No, I haven't. I filled it out to the fullest. What would you say is the biggest regret of your military career? Not going for special forces. You want to tell us about that? Um, I went for pre-course down in Hereford, did really well. And they said to me that you're ready for um, to, to to come and do selection, uber fit. I thought, fuck yeah, I'm going to do this. But I think my PTSD took over, hiding it because it was after uh, Afghan. And then I found out that there was like a 95% divorce rate in special forces because they would get used and abused. They're bouncing all the time doing stuff and stuff like that. If you go to Hereford, it's full of ex-wives that are ex-special forces blokes and all that. And um, even though me and my wife are strong, I love her and I like seeing her and look, looking at her, holding her hand, you know, and I don't, don't want to talk over her phone constantly. And she'd been for enough, the tours that I've done. And I said, you wouldn't see me. And she goes, we'll be all right, but it's my decision. Yeah. Uh, and what would you say is the greatest highlight or memory or the proudest moment of your career? See, I don't know. Ask Tanya. She'd be the best person to tell you because it's my bubble. I would say stepping off that bus from Afghan and seeing her there and cuddling her, knowing I'm back safe. Is it kind of a bit weird that you've got this recognition for holding the world record for longest snipe kill? I was thinking about how to talk to you about this coming down. 
I've got no clue if that's a, an accolade or not. How do you feel about it? I was doing my job. Yeah. I saved 12 lives that day. Wow. Well, I've saved, I've saved quite a few. I saved the whole patrol, which is 30 guys. Um, probably didn't have much of an impact on them, but where I positioned my vehicles, I managed to give them time to extract out. And then my men got stuck and I extracted them out with, with sniper cover and sniper fire. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So it's not the distance of the shot, it's... No, I'm doing my job. Yeah. I didn't know I broke the world record. I ain't got a fucking clue. Just doing my job. You know? And that, but that happened at the beginning of the tour in Afghan. And then I got shot in the helmet. Then I got shot in the chest. And then I got blown up. Loads of things went on. And then when I went home, and a free large journalist said, you know, because wh wh when I did my shot, an Apache came down and lasered it, because they, they, they come and help you, and the Taliban help the Apaches, because where there's one, there's two, and where the helmet looks, the gun will look. So they're quite, they call them the, the wasp. Yeah, wasp or bees, they call them, because they just fucking appear from nowhere, you know? And um, yeah, it was 2,700, 2,475 yards away. That shot just over a mile and a half. And um, I just went like that and cracked on. And then I told her. So told, that, that means yeah, you've yeah, done it. Yeah, yeah. You've done it. Not a broke world record. No, but no, you, that's what I mean. You, yeah, mean, you, 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 yeah, you hit your target. Yeah, you hit the target. Two yeah. of them. Right. Two guys. And they turned, about to, turned out to be Taliban leaders. Wow. And that's why I started getting death threats. And then they brought an out of season fighter. What an out of season fighter is, is a person that's not um, Afghanistan, like a Chechen or something. That's an out of season fighter they, to hunt me down, to because I was doing a lot of damage up north when I was snipering. But then, um, yeah, when we came back and I spoke to that freelance journalist, and. I got told, tell him your stories, and I said, oh, this incident, I've done this. And he said, do you realise you broke Rob Furlong's world record? And I went, no. Now, my rifle only goes 1,500 yards. It's only built for 1,500 yards. Can't go any further. Well, it will do if you, you know, but accurately it'll lose its accuracy over a certain distance. He had a 50 cal. They can go 4Ks plus, you know. Don't get it wrong, it's been beaten now. A uh, Canadian Special Forces guy has shot but that was a 50 cal. I would still hold it for the caliber that I used, mm. you know? And they say I'm the third best sniper in the world, but there's better shooters out there than me. It just happened I was in the right place at the right time, I suppose. Or, or maybe it's more powerful than that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I was destined to do greater things, I don't know. And this is all part of it. You know, I'm very blessed, very blessed, blessed with my life today, blessed that I've got a beautiful wife that supports me, not many people have got that. And my wife always says, every time we go somewhere, she always says to herself, I'm blessed with my wealth, blessed with my health, I'm blessed with my... Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Every day. It's obviously the way our life's been to have him still with me every single day. I just want to be, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Hmm. You, you say you have a daughter? I've got two daughters. Mm. And how's your relationship with them? Um, good. Yeah, good. I live, one lived with us when I met Tanya. Um, they're my stepdaughters, but I count them as my own. Um, one came with us when I married Tanya to London, and the other one stayed because she was in higher education. She's older, so she stayed in, in uh, Bedfordshire where I met Tanya. And then um, I'm, I'm close to both of them, you know, but Danny stayed with us, so I've got more of a rapport with Danny than I have with Leslie, but I still, still love them just as both the same, yeah. And I support them. No matter what they do, I support them. 
yeah, and she just had a little baby, Danny has, and I think she's five months old. Three months old. See, I don't even know. <laughs> you and I'm the granddad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm the granddad. But yeah, beautiful. Wow. She, is. And she married last December mm. a guy called Chris. And he's a fucking really nice guy. He couldn't, you know, and Leslie's getting there where she's gone through. So, If you could go back to that 16 year old self when you're just about to start and whisper something in your ear, what would that be? Concentrate on your career, get a trade. Yeah, get a trade. Now every time something... So it wouldn't be join the military? Yeah, join the military. Yeah. yeah, I was destined to join the military. Right. My mum bred me when I was 10 years old. You know, she started doing my washing and ironing myself at 10. Right. Because she said, you're going to join the army. Because where we lived in Cheltenham, there was no job prospects, you know. I do believe there's now guys that I went to school with fucking the same bird that they fucked when they was at school. You know, no one's moved on with their life. <laughs> you know? So elegantly put yeah. <laughs> No, no one's moved on with their life yeah. sort of thing. And, I've, and I, I'm, I've done a lot in my life. Yeah. I've done a lot and I've achieved a lot in my life. You know, and everyone that says to me, I think I'd join the army, what do I join? Join the engineers. Engineers can go for special forces. Engineers can get all your HGV certificates, driving certificates, bulldozing. You can be a carpenter, you can be a bricklayer, you can be this, you can be that. You can do everything as well as being airborne, you can be a PTI, and you're getting yourself a trade. And plus you're in the armed forces. Yeah. But 16 year old self, I wish I would have gone for special forces at a younger age. But you think, right, I was 16 when I joined the army. I'm a farm boy, you know? So I would just get up at four in the morning, do the horses, because we had horses at home. And that was my passion, horses, I loved them. And then I used to finish school, not do end of school activities, but come home again and finish the horses off. You know, finish riding them, finish skipping them out and doing that. So I didn't have any school friends. I was very isolated. So joining the army in London, fuck me, I was a weekend millionaire. You know, <laughs> never been drunk before. Never drunk beer before until I joined the army. Then I drunk beer and I was fucking minging. So I was like, fucking, is this what shit face is all about? Got a pocket for a fuck, I'll go for some fucking more, you know? having girlfriends, making mistakes through them, you know, and I'm thinking, is this what the army's all about? Fighting, getting arrested, you know, and not concentrate on my army career. And I wish I'd concentrate at a younger age because I blossomed at a later age in my career and people think he's an A1 soldier, you know, and I wish I'd done that at a younger age and gone for special forces at a younger age as well. Yeah, that's my biggest regret. When you did the Lad Bible interview, which is how I reached out to you, um, there are some fucking horrible comments from some people and there's some really quite nasty trolls out there. Mm -hmm. Considering you bared your whole soul and, you know, helped a lot of people, how does that make you feel? Nothing at all. Not no. bothered? No. Doesn't hurt you? No. Tanya blanks a lot of the comments from me because I get fucking... And I start talking to him, are you me? You know, you do what I've done. Like I got angry earlier, I apologise for that. You don't have to, you know? no, no, um, you don't have to. Um, you you my, weren't angry at me, no, I, no, no, you no, know. No. You walk my fucking shoes, yeah. all right? You do that. You do the point of where you think you're gonna fucking die and you ring your wife up to say goodbye because you think you're gonna get fucking slotted and then you're not and the relief and the emotions come all the way back. You do that. You sit in front of me and say that. You sit in front of me, all the stuff that you've fucking seen, people that you've shot, everything. And you sit there in front of me and go, well, yeah, yeah. you're just a keyboard fucking warrior, mate. You ain't got a fucking clue. I ain't got a fucking clue. And I guaranteed 10 to a pound of shit that they wouldn't sit in front of me. They wouldn't sit in front of me because they can just sit on the computer and do it. Trolls are trolls. And people, need to understand that through social media. Don't get dug in with trolls. Don't believe what they're saying. They're just fucking idiots. They don't fucking know. They don't fucking know at all. They don't know what they're fucking doing. And they, they feel happy trolling people and doing horrible comments. They're just keyboard warriors. They haven't achieved it. They haven't lived it, you know? 
Anyone can sit on a fucking computer. Anyone can. They're dicks. They ain't got time for them, really. Not time for them at all. Yeah. I'd rather help somebody. And I guarantee one day they need my help. They'll have something like a road accident or they knock a kid over and they have PTSD. Oh, fuck yeah, I remember Craig Harrison. He does that survival school. Don't I think I might go down there. Oh, you're that John guy who called me a fucking wanker. Oh, how you doing, mate? You all right? Sit down, mate. Tell me your story, mate. What's going on? And I'm nice as pie to him. Because of where I am. So final question. What's the future for Craig? Craig and Tanya. Um, what's your new dog called? Um, we, had, we got them from America. Um, so we had Betsy and Winnie. Yeah. Winnie was Tanya's. She passed away some time ago, I think three years ago. And then Betsy in mm. June. And then and Teddy. Teddy, that's we, it. We got yeah. him from America. And what kind of dog is he? He's a peekapoo, cross Pekingese cross poodle, right. about this big. And he's got a book too. <laughs> but he's got, he's got human eyes. Yeah. He's got human eyes. Well, no, that's, he hasn't got human eyes. Yeah. Just stick him in, but he's he's very he's very facial as a dog. Yeah. And we went to go and buy a sunbed for Tanya, and we found the place we were going to buy it off. But we had to hire a van in America, and the van hire place was inside a pet shop, random, and they had the pet shop till and the van hire till, and there was a queue for the van hire, so we just walked around the pet shop. And there was this, all the dogs were in Perspex cages, all of them, they were to the, up to the ceiling and down. And I felt quite sorry for them, little puppies. And everyone was facing us, except for this one white fluffy dog that was facing the other way. <laughs> and Tanya's got, like, like I said, she's not clairvoyant, she's got a gut feeling, she goes, on that one. No, she didn't say that, I said, do you want to hold him? And she goes, no, because I want him. I said, then the woman come out, she goes, do you want to play with him in the play area? And he was just a white fluffy ball. And he is he's a teddy boy. Mm. He's, he's a boy. I call him Boise because yeah. he's a boy. I get upset. He's just a boy, you know? And it's amazing what a dog will give you it's confidence. I will get another one. I will get another one. Because I'll always have Betsy in my life. But to give a dog a loving home as well. I won't replace Betsy, just giving the dog a loving home. And we will do. Yeah. So the future. Oh, sorry, the future. No, no, don't be sorry. Yeah, I drift just, off, don't I? I can talk forever, mate. Um, the future for me and Tanya. The school, you know, I'm going to register school, my school as a charity, so people can come on for free. And like I said, I'm not a therapist, but to have that respite, massive. And I've changed people's lives by doing it. So hopefully the school will get bigger and bigger. And I don't think my love for my wife can get any bigger. I'll give it a go though. I'll give it a fucking good go. Um, we just bought up a new house. So we don't, we're just gonna live our life and save and retire and just love each other. That's, that's all I want, you know? And I know I'm damaged, I know I'm broken. And I isolate myself all the time from people. I haven't got many, hardly no friends. But all I need is my wife. That's what counts in my life. You know? If I walk down the road, everything's blurry. But she's crystal clear. So I know what I want. So we just get stronger and stronger. Yeah, that's my future. And do you want to tell us where we can follow you and do you want to give us the website again for the charity you've got? Yeah, well, the, it, will it's, it will be a charity. Yeah. It's not at the moment, but everyone's welcome down. Veterans come down for free. So, um, and it's called the Maverick Survival School. Um, just put it into Google and it'll pop yeah. up. The webpage will pop up. And then um, I've got Instagram. It's C-O-H, Craig Hafferson. Uh, just type that in. My Instagram will come up. Um, if you're feeling depressed, suicidal, upset or anything, please log on and talk to me. I talk to Tanya, you know, some of the wives talk to Tanya as well, you know, um, and I can talk you through things. And if you're really, really struggling, please, please come down to survival school, you know, and just 
lose yourself for a while and realise that there is life's worth living, you know. And I'll, st I'll say it again, you know, if you're struggling so much, medication, you know, it's not the fucking answer, but it give you that respite and it relieve a bit of pressure off you. I think you're fucking amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Craig. No worries. Really grateful. Thank you. No worries.